tonight, uh, we get the opportunity to start a new series called Ex Please Explain, all right? Um, and the truth is we're going to be walking through this series uh, throughout the summer. Uh, but I started thinking um, there's a lot of things that we need explained. And I don't mean just you as a teenager. I mean us as humans, right? Um, you sometimes hear things that really don't make sense, right? Uh, I don't know if you like riddles. I found this one on the Googles. I am gentle enough to soothe your skin, light enough to fly in the sky, and strong enough to crack rocks. What am I? When? <laughs> wow, nicely done. I didn't think you guys were going to get Wow, okay. Uh, I did not get it. It took me a, what, what'd you say? Joke's on me? Joke's on, yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't get it. Uh, but yeah, water, good job. Okay, cool. Which, speaking of water, in two weeks from today, June 19th, all right, it's the Wednesday before camp, we are having a water day, all right? So we want to invite you and all of your friends to come and join us, all right? All of our games are going to be outside, uh, and we're just going to we're gonna have a slip and slide. We're going to have, um, you guys kind of saw a little preview of it if you came to family summer party. Uh, we're going to have nine square, but it's going to have some sprinklers on it, all right? So we got a bunch of water games for you guys to enjoy as well as your friends. So please, please join us on that day. Um, speaking of games, uh, how many of you guys have ever played this game? Kerplunk. Okay. I thought, I, I asked my, uh, my kids today, I was like, I feel like we've played this before. I was like, do we own this? And they're like, nah, Nana in Illinois has it. I was like, ah, you have it? Ah, I should have asked you. Okay. Um, it's such a fun game to play, but there's, real, there's not really any strategy behind it, right? It's kind of like, Luck of the drawer, the drawer, luck of the draw. What? There's strategy. There is. What's your strategy? Don't pull the don't stick. Pull the the stick. Off. No, that's the object of the game. <laughs> that, that's not a strategy. <laughs> What's that? No, you're right. What'd you say? Okay, just kind of. Yeah, there, there's no strategy to it, right? You're. I mean, you can you can evaluate. You're like, ah, there's more. There's more marbles on this stick, so I'm going to pull another one, right? Like there's some, some observations, but really no strategy that you can depend on that will, you know, guarantee you to win a lot of the time, all right? And then I, I started thinking through, this game is fun, um, but it sucks to lose, right? <laughs> because you have tried your best to make sure that those marbles do not come tumbling down. And then it just so happens that the one that you pick, all of a sudden, right, they all come down. Or a couple of them come down, and then you end up losing. And I started thinking about this game because, and again, I, I know you guys are not kids anymore, right? You guys are sixth graders, middle schoolers high schoolers, upperclassmen, some of you guys are high school graduates. Um, and I've said this plenty of times, like, I, I want to make sure you understand, like, we don't want to treat you guys like little kids, because we also understand that you guys um, have experienced life. Like, there's things that you guys have gone through that, that is not something that we, have, that we wish on anyone. There's things that you have seen, there's things that you have experienced, conversations that you've had, things that have happened in your life. I kind of made a, a list of a few things. Um, maybe your parents are getting divorced or have gotten divorced and you feel stuck in the middle. Like you got to play, play sides, play teams. Maybe um, you follow the news, right? And you start looking at things that are going on, whether you're, you're a conservative or, or whether you're a liberal. Like there's things that, we, that you look at or you read just not lining up, right? Maybe fear comes in. Um, maybe you're in the process of moving, um, maybe a good move, maybe a, not a, not a good move, maybe a wanted, like, yeah, I, I can't wait to get out of there or why are we leaving? 
Maybe um, someone in your life has gotten sick and it's not just a cold and it's not just a fever, but it's something that's attacking their body. Um, maybe a parent has lost their job and now money, something that you've never had to worry about, all of a sudden becomes a little bit more hard to grasp that maybe life isn't going to look the same as it has in the past. Uh, maybe you and a friend or you and someone that was close, you're starting to drift apart because of decisions that you've made, decisions that they've made, maybe directions, intentions, life. And you're starting to like wrestle with that. Like, why is this happening? Why, why are things looking like the way that they are? Or maybe you're just looking at the future and you're like, I just don't know what's happening. Like, like I know what's happening today, but I don't know what that life, what my life looks like next week or next month or next year. And that uncertainty, that doubt kind of creeps in. And living this type of life of perhaps stress, different things in your life that you're just afraid that if I, if I pull the right, the wrong stick, things are going to come tumbling down. My life isn't going to be as stable, as complete, as it once was. And all of these things are weighing you down. And you're looking for security. You're looking for hope. You're looking for something that you can just kind of just exhale, just, just rest, just find peace somewhere. I, I didn't ask permission from Stefan to tell you this story, but I thought it was... I don't want to say weird. It was just different because I didn't grow up with this. Um, but uh, when we were dating, um, I was a senior in, in college. Uh, she was a sophomore. Um, and one of the things that I remember uh, one time um, when I went to uh, her house, um, she had this little like, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a small little like, um, you know, one of those things that your grandma knits like a blanket, but it wasn't a blanket because <laughs> it was like this small. And I was like, like, what the heck is that? She's like, that's, that's my night night. And I said, come again. She's like, that's, that's my night night. I've, I've had it my whole life. I was like, girl, you, you're in college now. What do you mean you have a night night? Uh, she's like, yeah, I, I sleep with that. I was like, sleep with that? Like, like this, I mean, this little thing, like you could like see through it. I'm like, what do you, what? she's like, yeah, I just, I just hold it. And I, I was like, oh, and then, and then we got married <laughs> and she still had this night. And I was like, honey, I, why do you, it just brings me security. I was like, yo, I'm your husband now. Like I'm, I'm going to bring you security. All right. Uh, so safe to say years have gone by. She has not used her night night. All right. But, um, but even like, think about when you were a kid, like what were those things that like brought you security, right? Like for, maybe for some of you, you guys still have a night night and that's fine. Right. For some of us, it's leaving the lights on, right? You have the little night light. Sometimes you leave your phone and you have it, you know, the bright, right? Whatever it is, like there's something from your childhood that just brings back those good memories of safety, of security, of, of being in a sense um, at peace, knowing like, like everything's going to be okay. Now, some of you guys are going, dude, that's a lot of illustrations in the first five minutes of your talk. Like you've, like we've gone from riddles to kerplunk to night nights. Okay. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not a genius, but like, where are you going? Okay. So here's what I want to help you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to help you connect the dots here. Because the truth is, we all need help connecting dots. Because sometimes we hear some things, we see some things, we experience some things, we choose some things other people do to us. A lot of things and you're just sitting going, I, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand what is going on. And what I love about scripture is that Scripture is something that you and I can relate to. 
Like the Bible has stories about people that are just like you and me. They might not look like you and me. We might dress differently. We might have different uh, hobbies, different things, different likes, dislikes. But the people in the Bible are the exact same as you and me. And what I love about the Bible, one of the, the arguments for it is like, it's just a, just a book of made up stories. If I was going to make something up, I would make sure that it looks really good. That, that it makes things look perfect. Because that's what we all desire, right? Perfection, greatness. But you read some of these stories and you look at some humans and you go, you guys are idiots. And the disciples were probably some of the first idiots that we read in the New Testament. Because here's the thing, Jesus, who was 100% man, was also 100% God. And when he walked this earth, he talked in such a way that it didn't click with people. It didn't make sense for people. So when I say that we're going to be looking at parables, like I want you to know that these parables, um, th this is kind of the best explanation or kind of the best definition that I've heard of a parable. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So the way that Jesus spoke is Jesus had the mindset of God, thought like God, knew everything like God, but there was no way for him to say these things and humans to understand it, for you and I to understand it. So what he did is he would use illustrations, things that made sense to them in their time, in their culture. And when he told these earthly stories, there, I, I want you to know, like these stories are made up stories. Okay, these stories did not happen. But Jesus telling this story, there was a purpose behind it. Because there was a heavenly meaning, a spiritual meaning that he wanted the people, his audience, to understand. And so what we're going to look at is sometimes we read those parables and we don't understand them. So over these, uh, actually during the uh, weeks of the summer, we're going to be looking at the parables of Jesus and what that means to them and what that means for you and I. All right, so the first parable we're going to look at um, is in Matthew chapter 7. And here's what I want you, there's three questions that I kind of want you to ask yourself as we begin reading these parables, okay? First one is, what do you think this parable is about? Can you go back to the other slide, bud? What is confusing about this parable? And the third one is, what do you think the spiritual lesson in this story could be? All right? So as you're reading these parables, or as you read any parable, even the ones that we don't cover, ask yourself these questions. All right? So, Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24, here's what it says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. Now, a couple of things that I want you to, to see in this, all right? This parable is at the end of a talk, a message, a sermon that Jesus had been teaching. So if you want the full context, I would encourage you to read Matthew. Actually, it starts in Matthew, um, uh, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, and this is how he wraps up the sermon. I would encourage you to read everything that Jesus says because as he finishes it, 
This is how he finishes it. He says there's two types of people. And the first one very clearly says that he built his house on a foundation of rock. But what I want you to know is, as you read this, understand that this builder, the first builder, he, he's not a genius or like a master builder, right? It's not, it doesn't say that the house was structurally secured in such a way. It has nothing to do with the way this man built his house. Everything went back to the foundation of the house. This man understood that the foundation was on the rock. That the foundation was built on something sturdy. And the second person, again, was not a dumb builder or a genius builder, but what made him foolish in the eyes of Jesus, as he says, was the fact that he put his house on sand on not such great foundation. But what I want you to know is that the foundation and what made them uh, separate, what made the difference between the two is notice that it's when you do what Jesus asked you to do when you live, right? It's one thing to hear words. It's another thing to do. So what made the difference there is one was a doer of the things that he heard, right? That's how it starts. It starts, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Acts on them. They are like a builder that built it on the rock. So he understands that there's people in this audience. He wants to encourage them that those that hear and don't do are like the foolish builder. But those that hear and do are like the builder that builds it on a rock. So what does this mean for us, right? Like what does it mean for them during that time, and what does it mean for us in 2024? Well, it means that we have to build our lives on the foundation of God's words, foundation of God's principles for our life. Because notice that the storm came to both, right? It wasn't that the first house stood up because the storms didn't hit. Like the storms came. And that's the one thing that I want you to understand too is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your, your um, ethnicity. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your social status. It does not matter because storms are coming. It doesn't matter if your life looks perfect, if mom and dad are both in the home, if mom and dad have really good jobs. It doesn't matter if you're from a single parent home. It doesn't matter if, if you look at your financial status. It doesn't look if you're a good student, a bad athlete. All those things does, do not matter. The storms came no matter what. The only difference is that the foundation was on God's words and what God required and wanted for them. See, the other thing about this is that the listeners that were hearing these words from Jesus ha had also heard about a good foundation. They had heard these words before about a, a firm foundation. One of the psalmists in Psalm 20, uh, 89, this is what he says few centuries before he had written about a firm and steady foundations it says I will sing about the Lord's faithful love forever I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations with my mouth for I will declare faithful love is built up forever 
you establish your faithfulness in the heavens. Because of God's love, because God's love stands firm forever, because his words are true, because his words are loving, are kind, are helpful and beneficial for our life, that means that we can trust him. That means that we can build our lives around him and we can rely on it when not much else seems reliable. That God's words are a firm foundation. I think one of the things that is going to be difficult for you guys as you guys continue to grow and get older and experience life and experience the world is that there's going to be a lot of things that you will place your hope, that you will place your trust, and they're just going to fail. Things that you thought, like, this, this is not going to leave me, like, this is trustworthy, this is firm, and it's not. When life gets shaky and uncertain, God's words can do two things. It can comfort us and it can guide us. If you take anything out of tonight, I want you to know that when you begin to put this into practice now, and not if the storms come, but when the storms come, you'll have a firm foundation. You'll have a foundation that you can trust, a love that is firm, a love that is faithful, that is everlasting, that will never leave you or forsake you. That's what you can trust. Don't trust me. Don't trust my words. Don't trust your small group leader. Don't trust. The one thing that will never let you down is God. If I ever say anything to you that I can't back up from scripture, don't listen to me. If your small group leader tells you something that they can't back up from, their, from the Bible, don't listen to them. And that's why I love and I trust our leaders is because they will tell you from scripture. And if they don't know, they'll find someone that will know from the Bible. Because we're not here to give you our opinions, preferences, what we like and dislike. No, no, no. We're going to give you what the Bible says. Because that's the only thing that you can trust. That's the only thing that, we, that I can trust. I'll end with this. Um, for, for those that don't know me, um, my name is Carlos. Hello. Nice to meet you guys. But um, if you don't know my story, uh, my, my dad left uh, my mom when I was two and a half years old um, in Guatemala. Um, my uh, mom and I moved to this country when I was about nine years old. Uh, we moved to, uh, to New York City, Queens, New York. Um, and, and growing up, I always kind of um, just kind of excused my dad for leaving. I just thought like my dad just wasn't ready to be a dad. Like I, I had seen it again. I had grown up pretty quickly and just realized like, oh, there's some men that father kids and they're just not ready to be dad. So I just kind of excused that for my dad. And then as I got older and I came to this country, I found out that my dad had left my mom and been uh, raising two other kids of his own. Uh, hence why I have a half brother and a half sister. Um, and when I met them, I was like, wait a minute, like, like you're raising them. And, and as a nine year old understanding that, like, all of a sudden it became, it's, he wasn't ready. He just didn't want to father me. Like he didn't want to raise me. And again, you could have told me anything at that time to make me feel better, but I was so insecure about myself because all I did was I just blamed myself. Like I, I wasn't good for my dad. Like there was something that I did that drove my dad away. And again, you're, you're, you're like, Carlos, come on. Like, no, that's not true. But you couldn't have told me anything else. 
So growing up, I was super insecure about myself. I, I was always trying to fit in. I was always trying to find out who the cool kids were, right? I told you on Sunday, right? Like the cool kid in my first school in America was Colombian. So, hey, I'm Colombian. I'm not Colombian, right? Or, hey, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm not Puerto Rican, right? Like I was telling all these people trying to be something that I wasn't. And I say that because I remember I was probably going into like fifth or sixth grade. And my mom and I were going to a Spanish church. And it was a fairly large church. But I, for some reason, my mother um, always sat the second row. Like first row was always like reserved for the pastor and his family and stuff like that. And like we always sat second. And as a teenager, like, oh my gosh, I'm like this is so dumb. Like I don't want to be so close. Like I want to fall asleep, right? Like all those things. Um, and I just remember one time, um, the person doing the welcome, like the host, um, he, he did something different. He just said, hey, whatever God is like teaching you this week, or if you have a verse for someone, like, why don't you go look or, or share that with a neighbor of yours, right? And, and I just remember, again, I'm, I'm a little sixth grader, right? I'm like, hmm. Like, ain't nobody going to talk to me, right? <laughs> like, come on. Like, there's so many other adults. Ain't nobody going to talk to me. And, and the pastor, Pastor Cruzado, turned around and, like, made eye contact with me. And I was like, oh, shoot, like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he just came up to me. He's like, hey, Carlos, I, I don't know why, but the Lord just wanted me to share this verse with you. I don't know what you're going through. But I just wanted to share Isaiah 41.10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my victorious hand. I went home and I read that over and over and over again to remind myself that whenever there was times where I felt insecure, whenever there was times of insignificance in my life, whenever the storms would come into my life and I would be afraid and I would be fearful and I would be anxious or discouraged or whatever was going on in my life, for I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Those were the words that calmed my spirit. And whenever another storm came, Isaiah 41.10. And I tell you this so that whenever there's times in your life that you are building your life on a firm foundation of God's word. Because the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, there's times, there's days that we build our foundation on sand, on people's perception of us, on our popularity, on our followers, perhaps maybe on a crush or our relationships, perhaps maybe in money perhaps maybe in a job, perhaps in a sport, and pop, all of those things, those things alone are not sinful, are not bad. But it's when you build your foundation on those things, and when those things crumble, there goes your life. But when you build it on the rock, God's words, and you hear them, but you also do them, you're building your life on a firm foundation so that when the storms come, you're still standing. Let me pray for you guys. Father, I don't know the stories that are in here, Father. You do. You know the things that they're going through. You know the things that they're facing. You know the things that are keeping them up at night, making them anxious and afraid. But ultimately, you're the God that's always there every step of the way. And so, God, I pray that 
that everyone in here would begin to build their life on you and your words. That not only do they hear what you're calling them to do and the way that you want them to live their life, but Father, you're calling them to live that life and to do that. That they would begin to build that foundation for their life on you and you alone. That there's other things in life that are going to fail them. There's other things in the life that are going to disappoint them. And that if they build their life on those things, sadly, their life will crumble when those storms come. So I pray that as we go into our small groups and begin to talk a little bit deeper, Father, allow us to be honest, allow us to talk and just understand what that looks like in our life. How we today can we can begin to build our foundation on you. Father, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.